Hey, everybody, and welcome to Coin Talks. Uh, my name is Zach Wiles. I'm here with a couple of our ambassadors uh, in the Celsius Network. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, Josh, you are one of our uh, community heads. You run around a lot of things online, so please tell us what you do, and I appreciate you being here this morning. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh. I go by Josh Hoddle on uh, Twitter. And my job is to basically set up a line of communication between you guys and the team and the CEO. Make sure all of you are heard, all your questions get answered, and make sure you have a, a seat at the table with the CEO. So I'm really excited for today and uh, ready to get rolling here. Copy that. Thank you, Josh. We also have Wesley. Wesley, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Zach, and uh, glad to be back on Cointot. Uh, my name is Wesley Kress. I hold a dual concentration, bachelor's degree in marketing and finance and a master's of business administration with uh, a dual concentration in accounting and finance, uh, specialty in investments from the University of New Mexico, Anderson School of Management. I helped to manage over $7.2 million for four years for the state of New Mexico, performing equity, fixed income and portfolio analysis. I have also taught commercial banking and financial markets and institutions at the University of New Mexico Anderson School of Management uh, for two years at both the graduate and undergraduate level. I have over 17 years of financial markets and investment experience, uh, and I currently function more as an independent financial analyst. Uh, I've moved over from the legacy financial system into the crypto world, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Wesley B. Kress. Fantastic. Thank you for bringing that experience and knowledge here with us today. And last but not least, we have Joshua, sir. Joshua, thank you for being here today. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me back on the Coin Talk Show. My name is Joshua. You can find me on Twitter at Joshua TJO. I'm the host of the Celsius Daily YouTube channel, where I bring you the latest news charts and data on Celsius Network. I, too, am an independent financial analyst and happy to be part of the show this morning. Thanks for having me on. Awesome, awesome. So to hop right into the topics, uh, a lot of people know what Bitcoin is. Um, it's on the news all the time and people hear about other um, different digital assets, but not quite sure what it is. Could you tell us a little bit specifically about the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum and why one person might want to own one or own the other? Yeah, absolutely. I'll just uh, jump in and discuss a little bit about the differences. I think it's important to understand maybe relativity uh, to the existing world uh, so that uh, we have something to uh, compare to. Uh, so Bitcoin can be likened more to what we see as gold. Um, the big difference between um, you know, cryptocurrency and, and say the existing world is there's no, no single corporation or government that controls it. And uh, that's some of the advantages is that, you know, obviously in a tr traditional world, we sort of have to trust uh, that they're going to act on our best interest. And, and here we just have to trust computer code. And so it's very deterministic. It doesn't require us to, you know, hope that they're going to you know, act in our best interests. And if we've looked into history, whether it was a financial crisis or historically, a lot of times banks, financial institutions and central banks have not had our best interests at heart, only their best interest. And they've also produced something called moral hazard, which is, is basically this concept that they are only looking out for themselves and not necessarily looking out for the stability of the entire system. Um, and Bitcoin, sort of is this likened to this gold where there's this fixed supply of you know, 21 million coins that will never be more than that. And uh, we can all agree that uh, we can audit this open source code and we can all partake in this system. And Ethereum is very, very different from the standpoint. It functions more like a supercomputer um, in terms of this worldwide computer that's decentralized and it can function and allow applications and contracts such as smart contracts between parties and allow for rails or financial rails so that people can perform these transactions. And so a lot of times I think people get extremists in one area or the other, but just like our existing financial system, there are many pieces that are required for everything to work and function appropriately. It's just now we're building it more so that we don't have to trust someone. We can just uh, look at it through open source code and uh, it's deterministic. And so we can know that it's acting on our best interest and we can verify and audit that. Sure, sure. And, and there's a, been a huge divide between the Bitcoin community and the Ethereum community. Sometimes you'll uh, talk to a group of Bitcoiners and they can be a little hostile and defensive. Um, but then you can talk to Ethereum and they're making you know tokens about dogs and it may not be in the best interest of everybody. So, Josh, you've had a lot of experience with these communities. And 
what have you seen from you know, people that are all about Bitcoin versus maybe people that love Ethereum or just aren't um, so focused on one asset? Um, I can't say I've ever met a Ethereum maximalist, but I'm sure they're great people. Uh, Bitcoin maximalists are a very rough group of people. They, uh, they believe Bitcoin should exist and nothing else. They want separation from money and state, um, which I agree with, but uh, maybe not to the extent of them. Uh, they, they're very adamant about nothing else existing rather than Bitcoin. They're uh, big freedom fighters, right? So they want... Um, they think because they have censorship money that can't be taken away from them or can't be stopped that now they have the ultimate form of freedom and they can say whatever they want, do whatever they want without being censored. And I think that everyone else in the world should have that. The way that they go about delivering that message um, comes across toxic a lot of times. And uh, yeah, haven't met too many Ethereum maxis. I'm sorry. I wish I didn't have more information for you on that. Yeah. It's an interesting kind of dynamic. Like, and I, I value as well, like having censorship resistant money, um, having it uh, in private hands, not coming from the government, not being created out of thin air is, is very powerful. But I wonder why that message gets a little hostile uh, when talking to other communities that maybe don't agree 100%, but 90%, you know. Um, but we'll see how that turns out in the long term. And Joshua, I want to ask you about your the monetary policy of these two assets. So Bitcoin... 21 million uh, completely fixed supply. Ethereum, not so much. And, and what do you see as the advantage and disadvantage of those two systems? It's a great question, Zach. Perhaps I'd frame the question a little bit differently and say, what are the differences between the two systems? And perhaps not necessarily the advantages or disadvantages, but just to highlight, compare and contrast the two systems. So Bitcoin was developed in, in 2009 shortly after the wake of the 2008 financial crisis by a pseudonymous developer by the name of Shitoshi Nakamoto. And he designed Bitcoin such that he believed that money, uh, monetary policy ought to be fixed uh, rather than in legal contracts and by policymakers, but rather in code. And so Bitcoin has a very predictable emission schedule over the next uh, 50 or so years where the emissions have every four years and there's only going to be ever be 21 million Bitcoins. And he believed that putting that down in code and codifying it uh, prevents folks like policymakers from adjusting the money supply at whim. So that's why Bitcoin was created. And then Ethereum, on the other hand, was developed by the individual uh, named Vitalik Buterin in 2015, where he actually proposed to the Bitcoin community at that time, if he could add additional layers, what he calls programmability to the Bitcoin network, but they denied his request, so he went on to create Ethereum. Ethereum's monetary policy or purpose is more so that not only can you do transactions between individuals to send coins to one another, but also you can do what, what he calls programmable smart contracts on top of the blockchain as well. What Wesley had mentioned, sort of the world supercomputer. The monetary policy of Ethereum is more fluid. It is subject to changes based on voting. Um, there's an upcoming proposal to change the Ethereum network now called EIP-1559, whereas Bitcoin, very, the Bitcoin community is very adamant about not changing the monetary policy at all. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a hallmark of, uh, the, again, this big divide between Bitcoin and Ethereum is a little more stable and um, persistent in their policy or in the structure of the code, where Ethereum has been a lot more flexible um, and, and I want to ask Wesley, what do you think about the possible changes of these assets? It, it looks like Ethereum may be more upgradable, more more uh, flexible and in, in making more changes for better or for worse, right? And Bitcoin's kind of found its niche in making very, very small, slow steps forward. Do you think that's um, a detriment to Bitcoin or do you think that's an advantage in the long term. Yeah, I think it, we can speak about these points more from a risk profile standpoint. So I think uh, to the Bitcoin, you know, maximalists or people that are really um, supportive of Bitcoin, uh, you know, it, it, what differentiates it is that it's 
not only is it fixed, but um, it's been around the longest. And if we look at the history of money, gold has been around the longest. It goes as far as back as 600 BC. So this network of Bitcoin has been tried and tested and true over this long period of time. And so most Bitcoin maculas come at it from this angle that, okay, it is superior because it's been tried and true and tested. The, the problem with it is it, it would be like, it, it's somewhat of an immature conversation to be had because uh, it would be like saying gold is the only thing that should exist within the world in the traditional legacy system when we know there's a wide diversification of financial assets and functionality. It's just that the banking system itself is more where you know Ethereum or these smart contract blockchains come in and they are able to create this infrastructure that allows for things that Bitcoin may maybe can't do in terms of you know lending and borrowing, um, creating smart contracts and agreements between parties that uh, means that it has a much broader concept, right? A much higher addressable market. If you're, you're doing a supercomputer and uh, you're able to you know, do all these things, the utility of it is, is much higher. With that comes traditional or higher amounts of risk. And so because Ethereum was sort of the first mover and it has some limitations on the technological side, uh, it's slower and it may not be able to function in the capacity that is necessary to continue to execute these things on a broad scale. And so that's where the risk is. And whereas Bitcoin has sort of already solidified itself as this sort of uh, likened to gold and it does one thing and it does it very, very well. And so if you're sort of risk adverse, I would say you're probably more lean to, you know, the Bitcoin, but uh, understand that the utility of Ethereum or these other smart contracts is much broader, much vaster. And thus, you know, your ability for returns is much higher, but with that comes additional risk. Hopefully that clarifies things, Zach. Yeah, the, I mean, Ethereum has allowed this entire DeFi explosion to bring like loans and, and earning yield that has never existed on Bitcoin before, right? And Celsius takes advantage of these deep private products to earn as much yield for our community as possible. Um, and bring that over to loans. Um, Celsius offers collateralized loans. It's not like borrowing money to buy a car or borrowing money to buy a house, but you're borrowing money against your assets. And, and this isn't a new concept. A lot of People that are younger um, or not professional investors have crypto assets that they can borrow against. So, Josh, I wanted to ask you, what do you see as these kind of um, utilities for the average person to be able to borrow against their crypto instead of maybe uh, a car loan or a home loan or a credit card? So I love the loan program at Celsius. Like I've been a person my whole life. I've struggled with credit issues and building my credit and getting a credit card. Um, I didn't have a family that really uh, took the time out to teach me anything about finances or anything like that. So coming across something like Celsius where I can just store my crypto there and borrow against it and then pay, pay off maybe credit cards and stuff or pay down bills and, and then be able to put a portion of it towards uh, an investment that I might, if I might see like an opportunity in the market has helped my life tremendously, like tremendously. When the pandemic hit, if I didn't have all the, all those tools available to me, I would have been in serious trouble, very serious trouble. And it was because I was able to borrow against my assets, um, pay off bills, so that I wouldn't have to get caught up into the all the rental issues that I'm sure you know millions of Americans are in right now. If I wasn't able to do that, I'd be really, really screwed. But I also was able to take a portion of that and invest it um, into some timely uh, things in the market and able to boost it up and then pay that loan off. So I've had nothing but a great experience and I'm really glad that exists. I've never even heard of a 1% loan my entire life. I've been used to uh, very high interest, everything, because I've had, you know, really crappy credit, unfortunately. So I'm very thankful for the yeah. loan process. Yeah, usually yeah, I'd say a 1% interest rate in a, in a 24% loan. But uh, go ahead, Joshua. Yeah, I was going to build on what Josh said. So oftentimes when we think about loans and when we think about debt, there's sort of a sentiment that this is a negative thing. We want to try to stay debt free is the thing is sort of what people like to say. But um, the truth is there is good debt, like we as we like to call it, and then there's bad debt. Good debt is taking debt on appreciating assets. So if we believe that cryptocurrency uh, is going to tend to appreciate over time and taking debt against that, you can then use that free capital to do other things. As Josh had mentioned, you could use it to pay down 
your bad debt, things like credit card loans, car loans, and things of that nature. So bad debt is taking loans against things that are depreciating assets. It's a very po powerful financial tool that um, a, a lot of people, again, just didn't have access to. This is not something that banks offer. They, they mostly offer bad debt unless you're getting something like a mortgage, right? Um, so I want to ask Wesley, what is the difference in our loan structure versus, say, borrowing money for a car? Usually people say, oh, okay, I want to buy this car. I'm going to borrow money and then I pay principal but in, and interest. With our loans, that's not how they operate. And I was wondering if you'd go into the details of that and how they function. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what's important to understand is uh, there's secured debt and unsecured debt. And that's where secured debt is a form of collateralized uh, loans. And so um, it, d it differs in terms of the risk profile for the lenders. They also operate off a function called fractional reserves, where it's basically implicit leverage within the system. And so when you deposit uh, your money, uh, say $100, they're able to lend out uh, $90. Um, and that's typically based on the historical reserve ratio that they have to keep. Um, now, since COVID happened, the crisis happened, we've actually seen where the Federal Reserve had to step in and pull reserve ratios down to 0% for the first time in history, just to support the liquidity within the system. And so the risk profiles are entirely night and day. And so the reason that Celsius can offer this say 1% loan is that everything that the individual is borrowing against is fully collateralized. In our traditional life, we all borrow or take out a loan like a mortgage. The mortgage is a collateralized as the home itself. So if something were to happen to where you or I couldn't pay on that home, they would just take the asset, which is the house in this, and they would be made whole. And so in the case of Celsius, they are basically allowing you to borrow against digital assets. Digital assets um, are essentially like cryptocurrencies. And, you know, based on the risk profile, you can take a loan to value up to you know, 25 to 70, 75 percent. And so there's risk parameters in there. And this allows for a very different stability of the system, because in traditional legacy financial system, because there's tremendous amounts of unsecured debt within the system and lots and lots of leverage, um, their risk is significant. Uh, and it's sort of the polar opposite of what Celsius is doing. And this is why um, they can offer such low rates, um, which is very, very different than how traditional systems uh, function. Uh, hopefully that clarifies sort of the difference between secured and unsecured debt. Unsecured debt examples are like credit cards that have 20, 24%. If you happen to not pay back your credit card, there's nothing there as an asset that's tied to it. So they can't be made whole. Your credit score is obviously ruined, so you can't necessarily take out further debt. But uh, ultimately, uh, it's much more unstable for the entire system and the financial institution as a whole. Sure, sure. So you have uns unsecured debt that's like uh, a credit card. There's nothing backing it. And those interest rates tend to be very high. And then you have secured debt, like an auto loan or a mortgage. And those rates tend to be very low. Uh, Josh, do you want to add something, to something real quick? Also, Wesley, you're talking about people borrowing against their homes and stuff. Like I, I've never done that, but uh, I imagine it's not a, a, a smooth and quick process. Absolutely, and that's really what Celsius is different, right? It's because it's built on the blockchain. Uh, I used to uh, teach, like I mentioned earlier, commercial banking, and we used to analyze financial institutions something called a UBPR. It's a Uniform Bank Performance Report, and regulators like the FDIC, the, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, they use these. Uh, analytical tools in order to understand the risk profile of financial institutions. And so that's a significant uh, difference is that no, I, I promise you have to analyze in all the banks, there was not a single one that was completely collateralized, meaning secured as an entirety. And yet Celsius is. And so if you were to risk profile them, it would be entirely different because uh, they don't allow for unsecured debt. And the speed um, is simply due to the ability and technological advancement of blockchain technology. Uh, and that's a great point, Josh, is the speed at which things can occur um, is significantly reduced and the overhead is significantly reduced. Sure. Now, when you take a loan from Celsius, you're locking up your collateral that's in the wallet and then borrowing against those assets. So there's very little risk for the company and the community. And that's why we can offer uh, these products instantly. I mean, it's an amazing product. Close the loan within the app. It, very fantastic. Love the loan. Something else that's really shocking is the rates. 
Now, Celsius is the first one to ever offer a 1% loan, meaning you borrow X amount of dollars and you only pay 1% per year on that borrowed money. Instead of charging our customer, our community, we're able to not charge you almost anything and then charge the people that were lending those coins out, right? That lock collateral, we're going to charge the people on that side of the thing. We're not going to charge our own community. Right? And that's just another example of how Celsius always acts in the best interest of its community. Quick points on that, uh, Joshua, to follow up on the loans. Um, are there any fees? Are there any... Uh, hidden things that start when you start the loan? Are there any hidden costs when you close the loan? Um, anything like that? If there were fees, then Celsius would not be operating in the best interests of their community. But because there are, they are, there are no fees at all when you take out a loan or when you close a loan, except for the interest payment that you had to pay on that loan. Right. And it's against an interest only loan. So you're, you're just paying your monthly payment on the 1% of the borrowed money. Once that uh, loan, you close that loan by returning the principal, um, everything stops, your, your collateral is returned to you right away. It's all done with an app, a uh, beautiful system. So I want to thank everybody again for being here today. Uh, Josh, Wesley, Joshua, it's fantastic talking with you and uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks for having us. Thanks Dad. for having us on.